closest to January 22nd. Years ago, President Reagan recognized this particular Sunday, whatever Sunday fell in January closest to the 22nd, as Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. The church embraces that wholeheartedly because we are for life. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and God brought us from death to life. We are for life. We understand that the sixth commandment, which says you shall do no murder, also says you shall do everything within your own power to protect your own life and the life of others. And so annually, this is celebrated across evangelicalism throughout this country. And we are glad to stand and speak to this matter, uh, this holocaust that has come upon our nation. I'll refer to this in a moment, but on your bulletin cover, Linda printed a graphic that should at once shock you and grip you. Worldwide, abortion outstrips every major cause of death. Talk a little more about that in a moment. The slaughter of the innocent continues unabated. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 to 18, if you would. Stand with me while we read from this text. It's brief. Don't be fooled by its brevity. Matthew chapter 2, 16 to 18. Follow along as I read. We've just gone through this, by the way. Christmas time, the incarnation passages, so this will be fresh on your mind. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord speak to us today. Open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our, our compassion, our commitment uh, to be people found loving life, recognizing the value of all life since we're all creatures made in the image of God. Thank you. Please be seated. While you're being seated, I want, do want to say thank you so much to Brother Norman Hare who, who preached last Sunday. I know you were blessed in that. Uh, to Lynn Ritter who led our worship. To, to Joyce Morgan who, who accompanied on the piano. Thank you. Thank you for using your gifts that God's given you to bless our church. We missed being here. Our family did, uh, but we had a wonderful time uh, in Texas with family, some of whom we haven't seen in quite a while. Well, what is January 22nd? On the 22nd of January, 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court rendered the most horrendous, malicious, bloodthirsty judgment in a case called Roe v. Wade, otherwise known as 410 U.S. 113. The challenge to the constitutionality of laws that criminalized or restricted access to abortions. I want to say here, if you're sitting here today and you have had an abortion, I have no malice toward you. I, I have heartache and compassion toward you. And our gospel speaks a word to you. What I'm speaking about today with, with uh, holy conviction are those who are the purveyors of this, those who merchandise in this, those who've never seen an abortion they wanted to stop. So I want to make that clear today. I think every woman who has an abortion is a victim herself. We want to minister the gospel to those. But the Supreme Court sitting in 1973 by decision of seven to two said that a right to privacy under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment extended to a woman's decision to have an abortion. Now they said also that it needs to be balanced by the state's concern, but that's a bunch of hooey. It's a bunch of hooey. If you keep up with what's going on, you know that this Tuesday, the New York State Assembly, their legislature, 
will vote on a bill that says that abortion can take place up until birth because the fetus is not a human being until it is born. We're a country under the judgment of God because of those in power who've made decisions to let blood, the blood of the unborn, flow freely. 46 years ago, this, was, this happened. And, and the statistics vary. I heard what, what Becca said. The statistics I came across this week, since that time, 57.5 million babies have been slaughtered, perhaps as many as 73. This year alone, as your bulletin says, 41.9 million abortions have been performed worldwide. The number one cause of death greater than five times the number of people who died from cancer. Cancer is awful. We ought to pray to God for a cure. But do you wonder why God is not giving us a cure for cancer when we're slaughtering five times that number of people in the womb? More than eight times the number of people who've died from smoking. Smoking is dangerous. It says so on the package. More than 24 times the number of people who've died from HIV and AIDS. We ought to find a cure for that. But do you hear... Do you hear the irony? Do you hear the hypocrisy? When we're searching for cures for these things and yet wholesale allowing the murder of unborn babies in the womb. And then if that were not bad enough, the whole case, if you follow the history of this, you know that the whole case for Roe v. Wade was predicated on a lie. Norma McCorvey, who, who in 1970 was discovered, she, had, she was in Texas, having her third child. She'd had uh, two pregnancies previous, had two children, bad relationships. Wanting out of the third pregnancy, found a couple of attorneys who said, we want to represent you. And they took it all the way to the Supreme Court in 1973 and got this. She had the baby, by the way. She had the baby up for adoption. And then, years later, said, I was not really raped, if I, if I maintain. The whole argument of Roe v. Wade based on a lie. Again, is it any wonder that God is judging this nation? We're under the judgment of God. We need to see that. We need to stand for life as, as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, the good news is that years later, Norman McCorvey, through the witness of, a, of an Operation Rescue advocate, uh, I think next to the clinic where she was working, uh, he befriended her, engaged her, and the Lord saved her. Norma McCorvey died, a follower of Christ, but broken to the core because of what of the Holocaust she unleashed, helped to unleash on this nation. You look at our text here today of a time when the wise men had come seeking the babe. Born, this star that, that they understood was to show them this one who was born king of the Jews. And Herod himself had a bloodlust. He wanted power at any cost, and he ordered the slaughter of every male child under two years and under in Bethlehem and in all that region. So it wasn't just isolated to Bethlehem. Jeremiah had prophesied such a thing. Chapter 31, verse 15, when he spoke it, he was reflecting upon Rachel, who was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, who were Joseph carried off into Egypt, Benjamin ultimately taken to Egypt, and you know the, the story of what happened there. Weeping for her children. I think the posture of, of Americans ought to be that of weeping for the loss of children. Someone has said, how do we know that, that, that one in the womb who would have been born and grown up and raised to be a doctor and discover cancer, how do we know we haven't already slaughtered that one? We need to have that spirit, a broken spirit, a contrite spirit before the Lord. 
This has happened, obviously, because of leadership uh, in, on the Supreme Court, leadership uh, in, the, in the Congress, leadership from state to state. Oklahoma, as conservative as we are known, our abortions are rising. Rising. Conservative sitting in the White House, Donald Trump, for all the good he has done, if you believe he's done any good, has not done a thing successfully to stop one abortion. There are bloody hands, folks. Bloody hands. We read from the Old Testament. I don't know if you're familiar with that passage. It's in some of the laws of, of how the society would function. Chapter 21, making the distinction between someone who, who assaults a woman would hit her in the, in the text and cause her to prematurely deliver. And that premature delivery would be, this person would be found at fault for assault and triggering that and would be fined. But when you keep reading, you realize if harm comes in that assault to the, to the woman or to the baby, the distinction is not made because both are life. Both are creatures made in the image of God. Then whatever harm comes to the woman or the baby, the person causing the harm shall pay life or life. It goes down and describes it. What you're reading there is what's called the lex talionis, the, the law of retributive justice, seems cruel to us in a day of watered-down justice. God's position then and is now that if you unjustly take the life of a creature made in the image of God, the only way you satisfy that from heaven's perspective is by your own life. That's why I say to you that we're under the judgment of God. 57, 60, 70 million babies put to death legally in this nation. Supreme Court justices, even those who sit now, who've never seen an abortion they thought should be stopped, they deserve the death penalty. Congressmen and women, this new Congress has just been seated a week or so ago. And their first act was to attempt to extend abortions. Every congressman, every congresswoman who is, who is for this should be executed. They've committed a capital crime in heaven's sight. We need to see how serious this is. Stand accordingly. We live in a day you read, if you listen, where Oprah Winfrey's magazine O promotes the shout your abortion agenda. You see what's happened, folks? A generation that would have, would have years ago, remember when President Bill Clinton said, I think abortion ought to be uh, safe, legal, and rare. Now we've come to shout your abortion. You've had one boast to the world. Women's march. All the wicked, vile signs they carry. Billboards going up now. I've had my abortion and I'm proud of it. Folks, you, 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 you've got to see these things from heaven's perspective. This generation has gone so far beyond Sodom and Gomorrah. You need to understand. Yes, we live in the, the most blessed nation on the face of the earth, but to whom much is given, much is required. It's up to the church to stand in the gap. We must be the ones who are for life. You read Isaiah chapter 1, I don't have it on the screen, but, but Isaiah chapter 1 has some interesting things to say, the, the, the evangelical prophet Isaiah. He says in verse 2, children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. 
a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They've forsaken the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel. They're utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. Bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. Sound familiar to you? Well, this was written 800 years before Jesus. It has a ring of familiarity about it. The daughter of Zion, the women, are left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Because you see, abortion, the abortion industry, Planned Parenthood, founded by Margaret Sanger, and Margaret Sanger's agenda in founding Planned Parenthood was to put these clinics in African-American neighborhoods so that she could at least limit or possibly exterminate what she called mongrel races. If you do any study today, you'll find that these clinics populate minority neighborhoods. In New York City last year, there were more abortions than live births. Scales have been tipped. So this is an assault upon women. In the, in the ugly euphemism of it's a woman's choice, they seem to disregard that half of the babies aborted are women, female. And so we're under assault. Where does this come from? It comes out of the pit of hell. The devil himself, he's a liar, so it does not surprise me that Roe v. Wade was predicated on a lie. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. It does not surprise me at the bloodlust. We've learned this last year through hidden video Planned Parenthood makes its money providing abortion. Makes more money selling aborted baby body parts. I don't like to talk like this. Church cannot afford to be asleep in the light. We're the ones. Judgment begins at the house of God, the Scriptures. And the question will be asked of us. Did you speak up? Did you stand for life? Did you support those on the, on the front lines? I pray that when we leave here today that every one of these bottles will be gone from that table. We'll take them home. We'll fill them up with our change. And when we run out of change, we will, we will write checks. We will put, find cash. And we will bring these back to bless this ministry in our city that's on the front lines. You do realize that Planned Parenthood clinics Many of them also have sonogram machines. You know what they do with them? They turn them away from their client. So they cannot see what the sonogram shows. We're up against the enemy of our souls who wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Planned Parenthood, their like-minded clinics never talk about PTSD that a woman goes through after she's had an abortion. Because you see, you know this very well. You women do. That when you've found yourself pregnant, God takes over. I remember when we were in seminary, we had, a, I was telling someone yesterday, we had eight to ten couples, close friends of ours. Karen was the first one in that group who became pregnant. And I remember the women saying, oh, that's just going to be so awful. I just, golly, how are you, you going to? One by one, they all got pregnant. And one by one, a radical maternal transformation took place. That's God's way. That's what he does. Because that is true, suffer greatly in the aftermath of an abortion. You may say I'm proud of it, but deep down inside you're dying. 
They don't talk about that on Capitol Hill when they want to push the agenda as Planned Parenthood fills the pockets of our legislature's money. We've got to be the ones. We've got to be the ones who cry out, who speak up. God goes on and says in this first chapter of Isaiah, what to me, he's speaking to his people now, is the multitude of your sacrifices. He said, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? He says he doesn't like it. The prophet promises that if the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, and that's how we need to see ourselves in this, in this holocaust, the unborn, in this sea of blood. If the Lord of hosts had not left a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So the challenge is for the church in a bloodthirsty land that wants abortion on demand, available to all. We say no. No. We pray earnestly. One of the things I pray, dear God, those justices on the Supreme Court who are still bloodthirsty, for abortion, change their hearts or remove them. I pray, dear God, those, those congressmen and congresswomen who want to push this agenda, this, this wicked agenda that's brought a, brought a curse upon our nation, change their hearts or remove them by any means. I do not care what means. They have no place bringing any influence. For doctors who perform these procedures, change their hearts or remove them. For women who are misled and led to the slaughter, dear God, put, put a follower of Christ in their path. So teach them the love of Jesus. Show them love and mercy and concern. to pray. We need to let folks know that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is that he brings the dead to life. He changes hearts and he forgives sin. That's our message. That's why we're the only ones who have a word in this arena. So I want to close with you this morning. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. The book of wisdom. Brother Norman preached on getting wisdom last Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. An unborn baby in the womb has no voice. Sonogram shows you that what's in the womb looks just like what's on the slide there. A little baby, a human being. Someone must speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up. Judge fairly. Judge, make a righteous judgment according to life. And defend the rights of the poor and needy. We pray. We speak. When someone tells you, well, abortion is a woman's choice, you say, no, it's not. If it was, then you would take heed and have concern for for the baby girls whose lives are taken. It's not a woman's issue. Tell them lovingly, we're accountable to our Creator. He's the one who opens the womb, Scripture says. In the, in the most tragic problem pregnancy you've ever known or heard of, God, for reasons known only to Him, opened the womb. He's the one who gives life. He's the one who takes life. We must be vigilant, vocal, compassionate for the victims, the woman and her baby in the womb. We must be clear 
We must communicate with our legislators. James Langford, Senator Inhofe, our senators, tell them, we expect you to do everything you can to stop abortion. Our president, his cabinet. Our congressman, ours is Kevin Hearn. I know there are different ones in different districts. They were counting on you and the role God's given you to be an abolitionist when it comes to abortion. Our state legislatures, where we're losing ground, we need to be vocal. They were counting on you to stand for life. We want to know what you're doing to stand for life. And if you will not do that, then we will find somebody who will. All those things are, are reasonable means, but folks, the only thing that's going to end abortion is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we pray, God, make the gospel effectual. And then we avail ourselves. Or do you want me to share the gospel with somebody in this situation? That's why we have an opportunity to plug into the PRC. There's, there's a ton of wisdom in this room. You could counsel in that place. You could volunteer in that place and love on those people who come in and, and give them that gospel aroma of Jesus Christ. We can, we can give. We ought to give. We ought to fill every one of these baby bottles. The starting point. I pray, join me. Thank Lord, forgive us, forgive the church. For years in the early 70s, the church was guilty of silence. Do you realize that in 1973, I was 20 years old, I want to be 20, this happened. I heard not one word of it from the pulpit of the church I was attending. I had to learn about it in other circles. So vigilant, vocal, compassionate, committed to life. At the beginning of life, at the end of life. You think that doesn't touch you at the end of life? Society that will open the doors, the murder of unborn babies, before long will say, we need to start getting rid of these folks who are not useful anymore. Mentality. So, love the gospel. Thank God for the gospel. Thank God that your mother had you. I think it was Ronald Reagan who said, I've noticed that all these, these women who are for, for abortion have been born. Right. Let's be faithful. Be faithful, because I know you are. You know somebody who's had an abortion? Love them. They're expecting Christians to rail against them. No, we don't need to rail against them. Love them. Love them. Tell them that but there's forgiveness in the gospel. You know someone who's an abortion provider? Engage them. Lovingly warn them that their hands drip with blood. And God elects talionis, the law of retributive justice, says in Genesis, he who spills blood must himself have his blood spilled. That's never changed. No matter whether it's Old Covenant or New Covenant, God demands a reckoning for those who mistreat image bearers. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And first of all, we're thankful that as God, you are the creator and that you made us in your image. And all of us are made, everyone, everyone on every side of this argument is a creature made in your image. And dear God, I pray that you would bring a revival to this land, that Christians who are image bearers of God and who are brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ by grace through faith, that we would be the ones who lead the way, light the way, that we would be the ones who love on the victims of abortion. We would be the ones who, who speak clearly uh, with, with intensity and emotion to say, this must stop. And that your church will continue to be the folks who will, who will rescue those who are perishing, who will care for those who are dying, who will snatch them in pity from hell and the grave.
Help us to be those who lead the way and light the way with love in our hearts and justice aflame in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. We prepare to dismiss this morning. This is an old hymn put to a different...